I have the pleasure of introducing my friend and colleague, Dr. Satish Nagula. Uh, Satish is our Director of Endoscopic Ultrasound and is the Associate Director of our GI Fellowship Program. Uh, and he has a special interest and expertise in Barrett's esophagus, and he's going to tell us about the contemporary assessment and management. So, Satish. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here today, and uh, it's certainly a pleasure to have been able to focus a part of my career on Barrett's esophagus. It was a subject of my uh, ever so eloquently written essay to my GI fellowship, and to be able to continue to do that work afterwards has been a real, uh, real privilege. So um, we'll start with the patient, Hardy Byrne. He's a 55-year-old male uh, without any significant past medical history. Uh, he's had nocturnal GERD for many years, controlled on PPIs, denies any dysphagia or dynophagia. He's on daily Prilosec and no family history of malignancies. Occasional alcohol use, a daily smoker. On exam, uh, it's overweight, BMI of 39, weight of 275 pounds, otherwise normal exam. He's very worried about Barrett's esophagus. His friend was recently diagnosed with esophageal cancer, whom, whom has had, and that his friend has never had heartburn. So we'll go through a few different things about Barrett's. We'll first start uh, with kind of how I think about patients in the office, about the epidemiology of the disease, and looking at patient risk factors. We'll move to the endo suite and uh, just to discuss diagnostic endoscopy and Barrett's esophagus. We'll do a, a clinical path correlation, looking at uh, pathology and how it correlates to disease outcomes. And then we'll circle back into the endo unit for advanced diagnostics and therapeutics. So starting with epidemiology of the disease and risk factors. So let's define Barrett's esophagus. So it's one centimeter of metaplastic columnar epithelium that replaces the normal stratified squamous epithelium, the distal esophagus. And the histology has to show intestinal metaplasia. So these two um, uh, photos here are normal GE junctions, right? This is the sort of pearly white mucosa, and again over here, the squamous uh, epithelium. And then these are the gastric folds. You can see these folds extending all the way up right to the Z-line. Even though the Z-line is a little bit curved and not necessarily totally smooth, this is normal. You need to have at least one centimeter of this salmon color that extends beyond the GE junction. So on the, on the edges here, the GE junction is way down in the distance, and this is all Barrett's esophagus, that salmon color extending beyond the gastric folds, up several centimeters, at least one centimeter beyond. So, in, so if you were to biopsy this area, this GE junction, remember, this is the cardia. So if you were to biopsy this and get intestinal metaplasia, that is intestinal metaplasia of the cardia and the stomach. It's not Barrett's. You must be biopsying in the esophagus, so you have to see those tongues of squamous mucosa extend beyond the GE junction, and then it's Barrett's. Uh, of note, intestinal metaplasia of the cardia, there's really, the, the, the studies that are there show no real risk of malignant progression. Um, so it's not a disease entity we need to worry about like we would for Barrett's esophagus. So, this is, again, another normal GE junction. You see these nice, thick gastric folds coming right up to this nice Z-line uh, uh, with GERD and, uh, and some genetic issues, which we'll talk about, um, and other patient factors. You can get Barrett's esophagus. Again, you can see the folds end here, and now you can see these, ex these tongues of Barrett's extending into the esophagus. And then maybe GERD promotes this, certainly a, a tissue-level mutation. So now you get Barrett's esophagus and low-grade dysplasia. It all looks the same endoscopically with more, maybe more GERD, but certainly more genetic alterations. You get uh, high-grade dysplasia, and some of these nodules might represent early cancer. And then certainly, uh, as the dysplasia uh, sequence progresses, you get to esophageal adenocarcinoma. So if we think about the incidence of uh, Barrett's, it affects about 0.5 to 2% of the population, about 5 to 15% of your GERD patients. 16,000 new cases of esophageal adeno CA in 2010, and 14,500 deaths in that same year. It just shows. Um, how dismal uh, this disease can be in terms of outcomes. And we can see over time the incidence uh, as the blue line and incidence-based mortality is the red line. And this has really dramatically increased over time uh, to today. In relative terms, so uh, colon cancer, um, largely due to some of our success with colon cancer screening, we're starting to see the relative rates in the, in the incidence starting to drop. Lung and breast, slight increases from the, uh, the, the 70s, prostate, melanoma. And esophageal cancer is rising quite dramatically, likely related to the obesity epidemic. Certainly doesn't match the numbers and overall incidence of colon and lung, but we're seeing a rapid rise. So who's at risk? Well, patients come in all shapes and sizes. And this forces us to really think about which of our patients is likely to get the disease, because it, you need to start to risk stratify um, your patients to decide how we're going to manage this. So 
when we look at race, this is a large series um, uh, from the United Kingdom in the early 2000s. And they looked at a pretty large number of patients, 5,000 South Asian, 13,000 white Caucasian patients, and 1,000 Afro-Caribbean. And you can look at the number of patients with long of Barrett's esophagus, only two of the Afro-Caribbean patients, and 16 of the South Asian compared to 400. So you get an adjusted odds ratio of a six-fold increase in your rate of Barrett's esophagus in white Caucasians over South Asians and Afro-Caribbeans, or even a, a smaller number still. If you look at gender, and again, multiple very, very large studies, 20,000 patients each, and male gender has an odds ratio roughly about two. So male gender, about a two-fold increased risk of Barrett's esophagus. And then if you look at GERD and Barrett's esophagus, so that this study, what it does is that um, they were looking at um, pH impedance testing and motility testing in patients with Barrett's esophagus compared to patients with just GERD alone. And what you can see is the higher the, this is the symptom score. The higher the symptom score, the more symptoms they have. The patients with Barrett's esophagus actually had lower symptom scores, so less GERD symptoms compared to your typical GERD patient. The Demeester score is an objective measure on pH test of how much actual reflux they're measuring. So the Barrett's patients had less symptoms, but a higher Demeester score, a more objective evidence of acid. So lower symptom score, despite more objective evidence of GERD in Barrett's esophagus. There's more manometric abnormalities in Barrett's. There's lower LES resting tone. There's lower rates of peristalsis and longer reflux episodes. So again, your Barrett's patients may have more silent reflux, which is certainly of concern given that they have this condition. Um, obesity increases GERD, you know, and it's through disruption of the GE junction anatomy and physiology. So I try to tell my patients, if you go to lose 10, 20, 30 pounds, your GERD will actually go away. A few patients take me up on that challenge, and they do really get better and can avoid medications. So they think the metabolically active adipocytes and central obesity releases pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is the classic apple-pear debate, right? So in those who carry their weight centrally, um, in the, like it's the so-called apple, those are the ones with the higher risk of Barrett's esophagus and also the ones who have a higher risk for cardiac disease. So a meta-analysis shows actually no association between BMI and Barrett's. But there is a significant dose-dependent dose association between central adiposity and Barrett's. And they do this by measuring things like waist circumference. So independent of BMI, the higher, the greater the amount of central adiposity, the higher your risk is for Barrett's esophagus. Other uh, important risk factors, so age. Um, and then another one is smoking, so current or even past use. And family history is a huge uh, risk factor um, for developed Barrett's esophagus, so the 12-fold increased risk. So who are we worried about? That guy or that guy? <laughs> Say what you will. Um, but he's white, he's male, he's age over 50, and he's uh, central obesity. Right? His BMI is actually right around 30. And if he, if he smoked, I don't know, that would increase his risk even further. So it, the whole point of showing this is um, to illustrate that there are certain patients who have greater risk of Barrett's esophagus. You shouldn't spend your time or as much of your time focusing on screening African-American patients or South Asian patients because their incidence is much lower, particularly if they're female. Um, and so there are, the, in this year's guidelines, 2016 Barrett's guidelines, they actually do endorse screening for Barrett's. So in men with chronic GERD, with two or more risk factors, age over 50 and Caucasian race, um, or central obesity, current or past smoking, or uh, confirmed family history of Barrett's or esophageal cancer. That's a lot of patients, but the whole point of this is that if you're going to target a high-risk population, that's where you go. So we'll move on uh, to diagnostic endoscopy in Barrett's esophagus. A couple things. So in terms of how you report Barrett's esophagus, it's important to use a standardized classification, the PROG-CM classification. Here is the GE junction down here. You should report the, the and this is the Barrett's that goes here with tongues that extend up there. So the C number is the, oh, sorry, is the length of circumferential Barrett's esophagus, and the M is the maximal length uh, to the very top. So this is a C2M5. It just allows you to standardize um, the way you communicate about Barrett, so it's important to do that. So other factors. So you know, several years ago, there was a big revolution of uh, the idea of withdrawal times and screening colonoscopy, and they said the slower you took, the more time you took to, to bring the scope back, the more polyps you find. Similar thing is, is being said about Barrett's esophagus. So this is a very enriched population. Patients with high-grade dysplasia referred to a referral center for treatment. And what they did is they actually um, timed how long it took to do, this to do that exam. And they found that the longer the time the endoscopy spent looking in the esophagus, uh, 
the more sort of nodular areas or areas of high grade dysplasia they found. So these are quite long times. So they, they actually recommend spending one minute per centimeter. So if you have four centimeters of Barrett's esophagus, you should spend four minutes examining that segment of Barrett's esophagus. And the theory being you see a much higher proportion of dysplastic lesions um, compared to uh, shorter times. Now, I, I think this is certainly quite a long time. If you've got five, six, seven centimeters of Barrett's, it's hard to imagine spending seven minutes examining. But the point is well taken that many people go in, look, and pull right back. And the idea is to stop, take your time, and identify subtle abnormalities. Um, so the other thing we look at is um, think about using narrowband imaging. So what narrowband imaging is normal white light uses all colors in the spectrum. And in narrowband imaging, we actually restrict it to blue and green. And what this does is it highlights the superficial vascular um, <clears throat> structures, which can give you a lot more detail. So this is high definition white light, all the colors in the spectrum. You pass it through a blue and uh, green filter. And now you're starting to see all of these irregular blood vessels. This is actually a malignant gastric ulcer. Um, you can see the texture in the uh, surrounding mucosa and then all these erratic vessels and all of these features were concerning for malignancy. And you can see over here how this does not look anywhere as worrisome and you can see a lot more detail here. So in Barrett's esophagus, this is a study done in 2008. This was standard definition, white light. And the same patient under high definition. And you can actually start to see some of this nodular texture here. And under narrow band, now you could really highlight all of these irregular loops. This was um, uh, high-grade dysplasia. And you could see on the <coughs> standard white light, you would have never seen it. Um, so moving on to biopsy strategies, don't do scattered random biopsies. So if this is the Barrett's esophagus, you really shouldn't just do a biopsy here and a biopsy there. You need to be systematic about it to try to sample a large <coughs> representative surface area. So be systematic. And what you want to do is basically take four quadrant biopsies every two centimeters for non-dysplastic disease, or take four quadrants every one centimeter if you have dysplasia. Integrating all the available data, you want to do standard, what we call Seattle protocol, the four quadrant every one or two centimeters, and then use narrow band or high def to sample any subtle mucosal abnormalities. <clears throat> so moving on to a clinical path correlation. So the first thing is the length of Barrett's esophagus is strongly associated with the risk of malignant progression large 1400 series, follow up of five and a half years, there's a 28% increase in risk of progression for every one centimeter increase in Barrett's length. The length of Barrett's was the only predictor of progression in this series. Share short segment disease, there was a 0.3% annual risk, 0.3% per year risk of progression compared to long segment disease, 2.5% per year. That's a pretty high number. Um, <clears throat> so risk of progression to malignancy. So if you look at the guidelines, they say, Non-dysplastic Barrett's is 0.2 to 5%, 0.5% per year. So I tell patients roughly 2 to 5% in their lifetime because it does cap. And then for patients with low-grade dysplasia, the guidelines say 0.7% for low-grade and 7% for high-grade. These numbers are actually misleading. They're actually much more significant than this. When you go through the details of the guidelines, if you actually send your pathology to, for expert review, most of the low-grades and high-grades get downgraded. And all the randomized trials with expert path review, low-grade dysplasia actually has a progression rate of 10 to 12% per year. And then the progression of high-grade to cancer is 20% per year. And so this, once we start to think about numbers this high, it underscores the importance of uh, proceeding with therapy, which we'll discuss in a moment. Other thing to think about is biomarkers. This is something that's um, certainly somewhat in the experimental phase. They do it here, standard of care at Mount Sinai, um, but not at all centers. They looked at a case control study of Barrett's with low-grade looked at all the patients that progressed on to high grade. They found that if there's P53 overexpression in the tissue, there's a six-fold increased risk. If there's no P53 expression, there's a 14-fold increased risk. What does this look like? So this is uh, somebody with Barrett's uh, with normal amount of P53. There's always some activity. This is overexpression with a dark brown stain and underexpression with no, no staining at all. The whole point here is that if you've got low-grade dysplasia and a Barrett P53, there's a much greater risk of progression to, um, uh, to uh, malignancy. Um, it's not ready for prime time, but I think we're going to see more and more tissue markers because there's millions of patients with Barrett's esophagus, and we need some way to decide who are the ones we need to be worried about. So let's go into um, advanced diagnostics and therapeutics. So therapy for Barrett's, there's ablation. So we destroy the Barrett's epithelium and allow for the normal tissue to regenerate. 
In endoscopic mucosal resections for nodular disease, the nodules may represent high-grade dysplasia or adenocarcinoma. So these are some of the tools that we use for RFA. These are these focal uh, catheters for sort of uh, focal areas of uh, Barrett's. This is a circumferential balloon for a sort of circumferential disease. The idea is you put a catheter with the balloon, you inflate the balloon, and then you ablate a circumferential area, and you move on to ablate the next area. With focal ablation, it's almost like the size of a postage stamp, <clears throat> a little area of Barrett's there. You touch it with the probe and you burn it, and you continue to move around, able to do small uh, spot checks or spot treatments for Barrett's. So here's a patient with, um, this is long segment Barrett's esophagus. Uh, the patient had low grade dysplasia. So we passed a wire down, that's what we, we do, the, we pass the catheters over wires. We, and then the next step here, this is the ablation balloon. So this is the catheter. These ridges are the actual copper electrodes that deliver the energy. And the generator is really nice. It automates everything. We inflate the balloon, and then it's basically timed once it's inflated to deliver uh, a fixed amount of energy. And the way the technology is designed, it doesn't go too deep through the mucosa. Minimizes the risk of deep uh, sort of injury to the muscle and minimizes your risk of stricturing. So as that balloon deflates, you will see this nice circumferential area, this even burn all the way throughout. And so that's, and I'll show you some data in a moment, that's certainly quite effective. Now with nodular disease, so if someone has early esophageal adenocarcinoma, that might go right just into the mucosa. We would call it a stage T1M. The risk of um, lymph node mets is only one to 5% which is actually lower than your risk of dying from an esophagectomy. So these are the patients that might be good candidates for endoscopic therapy. If so, if you have a low rate of lymph node mets, we can cure with the EMR. But if you have a, a larger lesion that goes into the submucosa, now your risk of, of lymph node mets is up to 25%. So your outcomes, if for deeper disease, you may be better off going for uh, esophag esophagectomy, although there's some data to say that's not entirely true. Um, so those with higher risk of METs, you go under surgical resection. You want to take out the disease and you want to take out uh, the lymph nodes as well. So what we do in an endoscopic mucosal resection is we take this lesion, we put a band around the base creating the pseudopolyp, and then we're able to apply snare cautery and cut right underneath it to, to cut out the entire area and then get a clean margin. And the, so the band really helps create that margin for us. So here's a patient here. And this is um, early stage esophageal adenocarcinoma, biopsied at a previous session. This is a bander, similar to what we use for esophageal varices. We identify the lesion. We're going to suction that right into the cap. And then we're going to deploy a band. And as we deploy a band, you're basically creating a little pseudopolyp. And so now that the band is, is deployed there, we're going to pass a snare right through the same uh, channel. And we're going to put a snare right around. So here's the polyp there. This is sort of your polypoid lesion. And then you apply cautery. So kind of repeat that for the entire lesion. So we'll clean that up for a second. And then you'll see at the end, what we've done is done a total of three bands. And we've got this nice defect right here. And that all came back as uh, adenocarcinoma that invade just the mucosa without any submucosal invasion. So this patient is effectively cured. We will watch them and do surveillance. Um, so the eff efficacy of radiofrequency ablation, 91% remission of dysplasia on, on, a, on a large set of studies now. There is a recurrence rate, 7% recurrence of, of IM per patient year, 1% recurrence rate of dysplasia. So we have to continue to watch these patients even after successful RFA. Um, when you think about it, all we're doing is affecting the mucosa. We're not affecting the underlying genetics and other factors that have led them to develop Barrett's to begin with. So we, we treat their reflux and we continue to survey them until we can better predict who's going to recur. <clears throat> this, um, uh, just to kind of show that the effect of sort of multimodality treatment, EMR, RFA, um, in the end, 98% remission from dysplasia. 93% remission of intestinal metaplasia. So in sort of this is a single center st um, study from um, uh, the Netherlands, I believe. And they just have just incredible outcomes. And it goes to show that Barrett's esophagus in expert hands can be just really effectively managed um, with endoscopic therapy. A um, couple of minutes on endoscopic imaging. So this is what we can do now with a lot of these advanced diagnostics is really see to the microscopic level during endoscopy. So this is a confocal laser endomicroscopy probe. Uh, 
And what it does is it gives you what we call an optical biopsy. So with this probe real time, you're actually seeing cellular structures. You're seeing the goblet cells and you can actually see the uh, uh, architecture of the tissue. And so dysplasia, you'd see more disorganization. So real time, you're able to look at Barrett's and say, oh, there's dysplasia. Let me just treat this now rather than take a biopsy and come back later. So that's something that we can do to help target our treatment and our biopsies. The new kit on the block is volumetric laser and a microscopy. It's a sort of big fancy machine. Um, it's a bloom-based system that essentially gives you a CAT scan of the esophageal wall layers, right? So you get this big circumferential image. You see all the different wall layers. And in this image here, you see this little cluster. And this is actually an area of, uh, of uh, subsquamous Barrett's. Barrett's buried underneath the mucosa. So using this, you actually get this nice cross-sectional 3D view of, of the entire esophagus. And this can also help us direct our therapy and to survey them afterwards. Um, both of these techniques, the CLE and the VLE, they're both very good. And we're still trying to figure out where they fit into our armamentarium. But it's certainly increasing our ability to diagnose and treat these patients real time. I still have questions. So which of your patients needs an EGD? This is an important one that comes up to us a lot. So basically men, GERD over five years, greater than two risk factors for Barrett's and esophageal cancer, they need a scope to look for Barrett's esophagus. GERD symptoms refractory to PPI, they too should get an endoscopy. You're looking for GERD complications, strictures, esophagitis, alternative diagnosis such as EOE or malignancy. Alarm symptoms, dysphagia, weight loss, they need a scope because you're looking for malignancy. But otherwise, there is no role for endoscopy in the evaluation of typical GERD symptoms. And that's important. It's a tremendous overuse of endoscopy. And you really need to think about what you're looking for. And if you're scoping sort of an older Asian female uh, looking for Barrett's, that's not a good use of our resources. Their risk of Barrett's is quite low. So now the next question is, can acid suppression prevent Barrett's progression? There's one meta-analysis that suggests a 70% regression reduction in high-grade dysplasia and cancer. There's another Danish study that says there's an increased cancer risk. These are huge population studies, but most observational studies suggest PPIs reduce cancer risk, and most patients on PPIs have symptomatic GERD. What do we do about the asymptomatic patients? So that goes to this article. This is in 1999. This is one of the hallmark studies that proved that esophageal adeno CA was related to GERD. It showed that patients with heartburn at least once a week had a seven-fold increased risk of developing esophageal cancer. But here's the number that actually scares me. 40% of the patients in this study had no GERD at all, and they had esophageal cancer. So what do we do about those patients? To put it differently, esophageal cancer, 60% of those patients had GERD. So if you took those GERD patients, and you found Barrett's on their, on their screening exam, and you put them in a surveillance program, sir, there's no RCTs, no randomized trials to support surveillance. Surveillance programs lead to earlier stage cancer and improved survival. But the data is conflicting, and some studies show no benefit. But most of those studies were before all the treatments we just discussed. Theoretically, surveillance and endotherapy should be effective. So fine, if you had the perfect surveillance or therapy program, those 60% of the patients would be fine. But here's the problem. What about the 40% of esophageal cancer patients who never had GERD? Well, that's what keeps you up at night. So you need something disruptive. Maybe an outreach program. We had the inflatable colon out in, in the lobby of the hospital recently for Colon Cancer Awareness Month. We had Dave working as a moderator, uh, basically shouting at people in the halls to go get a colonoscopy. Um, we had Chris and the inflatable colon um, trying to you know, target people with this inflatable endoscope. But outreach is important. We have been very successful with colon cancer. Could we do the same for esophageal cancer? Who knew that April was Esophageal Cancer Awareness Month? I didn't, and I do this for a living. So awareness matters, and it is important to sort of get that word out there. Maybe something disruptive, right? So there's trans sedationless transnasal endoscopy. So this way, in the office, you can put a scope right through the nose, look in real quick, and take a biopsy and be done. Don't have to worry about sedation, anesthesia, and those costs. This is the cytosponge. So this is a neat little device. And the idea is the, there's a little capsule that the patient can swallow attached to a string goes into the stomach, and then the capsule dissolves, and you get this nice big rough sponge. And now you pull the string out, scraping the cells along the esophagus as it comes out. There's an 87% sensitivity for detecting long segment Barrett's, and you're doing this in the office at the end of your visit. So maybe a new screening strategy is take the patients at high risk for Barrett's. Well, the current strategy is they get a screening endoscopy. If they have Barrett's, they go on to surveillance. Um, but, how, but that's a lot of patients you're looking at. What if you were able to do this cytology test? Right, with that, when you pull that brush out. 
And if those are positive for Barrett's or cancer, they go under a screening endoscopy. Or better yet, you had biomarkers that show that they're even high risk. And those patients get onto endoscopy, and everyone else just gets a very cheap little brush every year in the office. So in Barrett's esophagus, with low-grade dysplasia and high-grade dysplasia, uh, endotherapy is, is highly effective. It's first-line treatment. Recurrence is manageable. New technologies will optimize therapy. But this is where all the excitement was seven, eight years ago, right? And when the, the RFA first came out, and we were worried about how do we treat this. We're really good at this. Now the question is, for patients who have normal esophagus or Barrett's esophagus, we only understand some risk factors for Barrett's. We can't accurately predict who develops Barrett's, and unclear which patients will progress. Well, you have to follow proper endoscopic techniques, and there's new technologies on the horizon. All of this leads to our ultimate goal of preventing esophageal cancer. We're getting closer, but we still have some uh, room to go. Thank you.